a dollar in the swear jar. This is the first part of the Luke Cage review, episodes one through six. Be prepared. There is spoilers up ahead. Joining me today, Connor McGraw. Fuck. There's a dollar for the jar. Hunter Davenport. I miss you, Pops. Alan Muir. Peace was never an option. And Arlen Haro. I ponder a woman. And me, your host, Chris Smith. Let's get into some Luke Cage, motherfuckers. Episode one. Yes. This, we're introduced to the character, and Ann Pops, the local barbershop man. Played by and, Frank uh, Faison from The Wire. Yes, sir. Yeah. The, and the, from Banshee. From The Wire. The Wait, best he, character in the MCU. Is he Donald Faison's father from Scrubs? I don't want. I, I, I do not want to know because if I'm wrong, I'm 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 a racist for thinking <laughs> that just because two black actors have the same last name, they're related. Ah, uh, that's not what. I'm, whatever. What's that supposed to mean, Alan? Seriously. <laughs> let's let's move on, please. <laughs> before the FCC come after us and put a comment. Before we before those 182 uh, downloads dwindle before our eyes. <laughs> Please continue to listen, please. We need it. <laughs> no, 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 I won't. I, I promise. For our I won't egos. Look out for what I'm picking up. We don't know if anybody cares about us. Okay, well, yeah. Moment uh, episode was called Moment of Truth, and we met Pops uh, at the barbershop, who I fell in love with immediately. Yeah, yep. he's. I he's think really... everyone fell in love with them. Yeah. He, I, I've never like liked the character this fast. Like he just like he started talking, and I was just like, "This is like he something about him is just very charming and like genuine." Yes, and I, I wrote He's a, a, I wrote a nice quote down from the first episode, which was uh, not a problem for you, Power Man, and my little heart of obscure Marvel comics just burst. I guess. Yes. Um, little like I love obscure Marvel shit. And I, and I just want to say that this show just seems to be the most, like, they're just throwing stuff at me that I'm just catching. And, like, it's really, I think it's the most Marvel thing they've ever done, really. I feel yeah. like I was getting winked at every five minutes, and I was like, oh, you. <laughs> yeah, like, I felt like this, it's just like, it's like slipping into a warm comforter. Like, it just it, feels oh, right. Yeah. This feels oh. like something that's been missing from the entire MCU. Because oh, you mean continuity? Had, had those little wink, winks and nods. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Connor, continuity. First of all, yeah, continuity. First of all, I don't know if anybody forgotten, but the Incredible Hulk took place in Harlem. So yeah, there's Did, yeah, there's been no mention of that so far. Is, is it Incredible Hulk canon? Yes, yeah. yes, sort yes, of, not not really. yes, and no. I get it is, but it's a, there's a. I think it was produced under Universal, so there's technically some sort of like legal hubble about it. Oh, and that, uh, that Hulk is actually Mark Ruffalo, who isn't that Hulk. Oh, so that explains like how in Avengers they don't really talk about they talk about the Abomination. Well, no, like, he does say I wrecked all of Harlem. He, and yeah. there's also a post credit scene in Incredible Hulk with Robert Downey Jr. Right, and uh, yeah. Thunderbolt, Avengers. right? Yeah, yeah. It's a bar. But scene. Edward Norton isn't. Um, Mark Ruffalo. So, and eh? it's for the better. Sure. Uh, you know, and um, Donald Cheadle isn't um, Terrence Howard. Howard. Thank yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyways, back to Luke Cage. Um, but yeah, back to Pops. Like, I I feel like that he's a character that kind of he's like Uncle Ben almost. And yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like, I really, like, it feels like, like, he, he's like this pastiche of all this, like, father figures and, like, everyone who's came before Luke, and, like, he's just a role model, and, like... Hold on, one second. Think... Before we get any further, just know that we are gonna go full spoilers, so... Spoilers, and spoilers, 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 car spoilers. You've been Total warned. spoilers. You've been warned. Are we gonna talk about how Pop Scott is na- his name? Uh, Pop's got a name because he used to punch uh, people. And then make the sound pop. <laughs> yep. That was something else I love about his character, too, is that he, the, 
everybody's names are awesome. Pops, Cottonmouth, Diamondback, um, well, Shades. Cottonmouth Shades. and Diamondback, of course, goes back to the way back way years of the Servant Society and Captain America, yep. which my heart and soul of all comics is in the old school Captain America books where they had the Serpent Society in which they were recruited to that. So Cottonmouth showing up, I mean, he was missing the bright green suit and the little fangs and the little, like, Fu Manchu, but it was yeah. a pretty good adaptation. Yeah. I haven't, um, I haven't seen enough Diamondback yet, though, so. That, that, that actor... Facebook. I'll go ahead. Um, that actor is, um, I just want to say, like, uh, Cottonmouth very quickly, be, like, he very quickly proves himself to be, a, like, a really bad person. Yeah. Like, so that's, what I was, that's what I was just going to get to because Daredevil set the bar really high with Fisk yeah. um, and Vincent D'Onofrio's like, performance and like uh, Cottonmouth comes in and you don't need anything else but the sequence with the uh, the Biggie painting Yeah, it's all you needed to to know that he is a bad motherfucker yeah like yeah. He, you, you can't cross him like he I think the main difference between him and Fisk is Fisk is almost diplomatic like, well, Fisk is it, Fisk begins as timid and is still kind of timid and actually has to find himself in like Daredevil season two when he's you know in the prison, um, and he sort of figures out he's like I can this is my empire and I can rule it just like outside. Um, yeah. that's what he figures out. He's like I am the he's like I am the king of whatever I touch. Um, and he grows that way. We meet Cottonmouth and he's already just this nasty dude. Yeah, he's just there's um. <laughs> Well, we're we're talking about episode one, but I'll, when when it comes up, I'll bring it up. But yeah, um, uh, who did yeah. we meet in episode one? We did meet, we mentioned shades. We meet shades. Um, yeah, shades. I mean, yeah, I'm still kind of baffled by the, by his whole like thing. He he's an advisor, like from what what yeah. from what I understand, um, he's like he he were he's basically Diamondback's right right, right hand man. Like, Which we never seen Diamondback in the first episode. Or not, like, it was kind of iffy at first, because he, like, put on the shades, and then they they would just stop in their tracks and just look at him. And I was yeah. like, does he have powers, or is he just a dude with sunglasses? Or I believe in the comics exactly? he does, actually. In the comics, he yeah. looked like a uh, dollar store Cyclops. Yeah. Mm. Like, I was, like, super kind of baffled by that, where it was just like, is he powered, or is he not, or what's going on here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we also met Misty Knight, who Luke Cage Misty meets Knight. at Harlem Paradise. Yeah. Sexy Will Graham, as I call her. <laughs> I saw that I saw that note on Twitter. It made me laugh for, for a good 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Just, every every single time somebody does anything similar to that, I'm like, oh, it's, it's Will Graham, but uh, not. Oh, and we also meet her partner, who is actually important. Scarf. Yeah, I liked Scarf almost immediately. Yeah, I know the I know the actor from uh, Psych, where he was a like a guest star, I guess it were, as a um, a client that they had on the show, where he was like multi personality disorder. So he was like a woman, uh, the guy from Jaws, and then the actual character. <laughs> that sounds and awesome. I, as soon as I saw him show up on here, and I'm like, that's the dude that was in a dress. <laughs> it was actually a pretty funny episode of Psych 2. Yeah. But then again, but Psych is always funny. He popped up on here because I, I looked through his like, IMDb and like he hasn't done much major. So it was like kind of cool to see him as like a major kind of character. Yeah. Yeah. But um, uh, the plot for this episode, I guess, was basically hinged on uh, the arms deal that went south thanks to Shamik, Chico, and Dante. They're yeah. basically they're shifting in motion. They steal the money. They steal the guns, too, right? Oh, the Hammer Tech guns? The ha- yeah. yeah. The Hammer yeah. Tech guns. I couldn't believe it. for a second. Like, that, that threw me on the floor. I was like, holy shit. When's well, the I mean, last Vince, time you like, heard the name Justin Hammer? And just, and just mentioning his name, I thought, was just irrelevant. Like, it, it's his, he was, he's was he been done since Iron Man 2. So, like, yeah, it's some real Justin Hammer shit. I was like, what? <laughs> well, I mean, his whole thing was he was a... Uh, a weapons manufacturer that made like army grade stuff. And I mean, it, it like, makes sense. It makes sense that it's Hammer because Stark doesn't make weapons anymore. Yeah, yeah. So he, uh, they could have done AIM and been more timely because AIM was in Iron Man three. But yeah. well, I think I, I they did, were going to have weapons regardless, and they decided to tie it together by uh, putting Hammer on the name. Yeah. 
It was very interesting. I guess this whole this whole uh, arms deal going south basically sets everything in motion because that more or less kind of brings Cottonmouth into everything. With Domingo. Yes, with Domingo, who then gets who then has to call in shades. Um, uh, da, 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 da. And yeah, I guess it, uh, yeah, shades present basically again. Like I said, that gets the ball rolling. And uh, I guess towards the end of this episode is where we kind of get what we're all waiting for. Yeah. Which is the atomic wedgie through a window, which I just laughed my ass off at. Wait, are we going to talk about the uh, opening? Because this the opening is... Theme? No. Oh, the barbershop scene? No, no, no. The the intro. The, the intro to the episode. Oh, the intro is cool as shit. It, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, I think it's really cool. It's, they nailed it. Like, it's better than yeah. Jessica Jones. Better than Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is nothing, though. Like, yeah, I like that's that probably anything. It's, it's just no, the, the Netflix openings are far and away different from everything else that's yeah. Marvel. Because they're very, very, like... Like, Daredevils is... Like, the blood pouring like over the, the statues. have a lot of art direction to them. Yes. Yeah. It's a... Uh, I think... I really like how... Oh, another thing about Luke Cage that I really like is that it's way more colorful than Daredevil. Like... Or Jessica well, Jones. Yeah, just well, yeah. yeah. I said... Out of the time. Yeah, I said to someone, I said, the literal the literal night and day difference between Jessica Jones, Daredevil, and Luke Cage is very nice. Yeah, and it just makes Harlem feel a little bit different. It, like, it, like, mm-hmm. it almost feels like Harlem's a character, too, in this show. And I really yeah. like that. Because it's like... It... it it pays homage to, like, a, si- a part of a city that just kind of, like, people, like, that's got the Apollo. It's a, it's a very important part of New York, and it's just, like, I think it does it really well. And I don't live in New York. I, I live in New Hampshire. I'm just a New Hampshire kid. But, like, I think that it does justice to uh, a part of a city that I don't think a lot of people kind of appreciate. Yeah. Well, they do appreciate it, but... No, I totally agree. Um, it, it's just as much of a character as Hell's Kitchen is uh, yeah. in Daredevil. Yeah. And we're like, I think, the, again, night and day difference, whereas, like, Harlem is very, in this, it's kind of, it's far more full of hope um, than Hell's Kitchen is. Hell's Kitchen is, is devoid of... Hell's uh, Kitchen is broke. Yes, yeah. Hell's Kitchen is totally fucked. It's like yeah. Mad Max almost. Uh, not that far, but it's it's dark at points. Yes, it's a lot all of, of Harlem's bad shit is kind of underneath the skin, kind of like. Yeah, and that that's Maria Dillard is like the, the perfect characterization of that trait. Yeah, I loved she's... her in this so uh, so far, and I think she's the smartest choice that they've made, uh, the smartest change from the books that they've made in all of the Netflix shows. As far as I looked up, I saw a picture of her from a comics, and I was like, "Holy God, I'm glad it's not what they use." <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, when I know first read when I read Power Man and Iron, and Iron Fist, I was like, "Who the hell is this?" And I'm like, "Oh, that's Black Mariah." Yeah, She's I, a... all I saw was a picture of a very, very large woman with. Very large teeth. Um, she she looked like 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 you put Fisk and uh, Amanda Waller into one body. Huh? <laughs> <That's> pretty close. <cool. laughs> but she's wearing a jumpsuit. Uh, yeah, in the, yeah. Most of the time. But yeah. And this, she's like a totally. She's a she's a completely fake, uh, just public figure who is. Yeah. Rot is a politician. Yes, and I love how she, like, I think at some point in one of the episodes... Okay, I did admittedly watch more than episode, uh, six episodes. I got caught up. Uh, not before. But it's, you'll, I started to notice that she repeats her Harlem speech in every interview she does in the first six episodes over and over again. I think someone eventually is like, um, uh, you've said that enough. She's like... Right. But uh, uh, Harlem... They definitely like, yeah. Harlem politicians with that because politicians do tend to repeat the same thing. Yeah. yeah. She also, Make when America she that great kid, again. Don't she, uh, just stop. Like, stop. Just stop. <laughs> stop. When she, we don't uh, need politics. Put... Oh, go ahead. I said we don't need politics minute in here, Alan. No, we don't. We're not Sorry. doing that. It's just that I just but, um, 
But uh, when, especially in that moment where she put her hands on that kid's shoulders and like was like playing it up for the camera, and then she immediately turned around <laughs> and used hand sanitizer. Yeah, yeah. I was, was like, great. wow, she's almost a Disney villain. <laughs> Uh, I think she is a Disney villain, Hunter. She Take is. Like, I, uh, she really is. Like, I think Marvel. <laughs> Wait. Oh, oh my God, you're right. <laughs> he is a Disney villain. I do love the fact that these shows technically fall under Disney's, like, brand. And, like, I can watch them. It's like, Disney produced something where a man gets his head chopped off with a car door. <laughs> Disney <laughs> produced something called Jessica Jones where a woman gets raped. Ah, uh, why you got blank there? Oh wait, that was Snow White also. Anyway. Yeah, I can't remember which one has a hand in a blender, but uh, it might be Snow White. That was that was um. Uh... That was unfriended. <laughs> <laughs> that movie's all right. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, um, this is the episode of awkward pauses, guys. Yes, yeah, it is. Well, no, uh, we didn't get to the end of episode one yet, where we talk about uh, Luke Cage being fucking Luke Cage. Yeah, fine. It's just, it, 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 the entire episode, it feels like you're waiting for him to just, just, to just go full Cage, uh, and he does. And it's the Cage, status. if you will. Well, I can't. He has to. He, he's kind of holding it back. Like he's like, I yeah. don't do this. Like I'm. Trying to lay low. I really love how he's like, I'm not for hire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that made me chuckle a bit. Um, like I said, yeah, the atomic wedgie through a window, uh, I found very amusing. Yeah. I just love I love his style of fighting where it's not really he's like Daredevil's all over the place and Luke Cage just stands there and people bounce off of him. Yeah, he yeah. just he lets you punch him. And then he like, just grabs he lets- you by like he grabs you by like the sleeve and just chucks you through a wall. When he when he yeah. uses like furniture against you too, yeah. which I'll get to later. I'll get to later when we get to the episode. Yeah, yeah. And then like uh, the the hand breaking against his face was cool as shit. Yeah, um, that first punch. Like, yeah. I wonder if that's foreshadowing. Uh, maybe. Guys, come uh, on. Uh, what else? We got well, um, in, I really liked, okay, another thing I really liked is that he, he's this dude with, with, like, in the beginning they established that he's this dude who has, like, really amazing powers, but he, he doesn't, like, he, he doesn't want to show them off, really. He just, like, like, he lifts that, uh, that washing machine once when he's doing the towels for Pops, and, like, he's That's very cool. hesitant about his powers and, like, how he, how, how people perceive him. It was kind of like you didn't see Jessica Jones use her super strength too, too much. Like, yeah. Like, really had yeah. to. I think there was moments where, like, she grabbed that car, and she was like, please don't drive away. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think that that's what really separates Luke Cage from, like, maybe maybe Daredevil, because, like, Daredevil can't turn off his powers. Luke Cage right. can like, just a normal dude, like, with who happens to be able to, like, lift a bus, but he... he he works two jobs. He, he he struggles to pay rent. Like he hates he hates his other his uh, bartending job. Like he hates his boss there. No, no, it's, it's, yes. Who we should who we should mention is he's actually now. a dishwasher. Yes, he subbed yeah. in the bartending job. That was why that set up the whole the the gun deal because he was subbing in for one of the uh, one of the uh, Dante, I believe, it was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and that's and that's how he met Cottonmouth too. Yeah. Segway. Yeah. And that's, so, how he meets, that's how he meets Misty Knight, and we learn that Cottonmouth is Maria Dilworth's cousin. And then that's basically our big web of uh, episode one. That's kind of how we have all the players set up on the board. Yeah. It's, it's very much like this is – it's just an introductionary. Like, these are your characters. This is who – it's paced very well, too. Like, I, I don't find myself getting, like – like, I have a shortest attention span, and it's, like, hard for me to, like – sit still, and, like, when I'm watching Luke Cage, it's really easy for me to just, like, binge-watch this show. Yeah. It's very easy to pay attention and to not get lost in the minutia. Yeah. So, are we ready to move on to episode two? Yeah. Can I start with a pop quote for episode two? Yes, sure. you can. I already know what it is. 
Kenyatta the best black hero this side of Shaft? (laughs) (laughs) Not what I was expecting. Hey, episode two quote. That's episode two quote. Yeah, um, where but I mean, got Shaft. Haircut from Bob, and he's like, unless your last name is Corleone Shaft, or what was the other one? He's like, you don't get paid for haircut. Yeah, Corleone Shaft, or is that a, 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 is it a basketball player? I can't remember. No, no, no it was a basketball coach. R- O'Reilly, I think, or something. I think it was Riley. Wait, Wait anyway. back to the Riley. Fact. That's no, it is Riley. You're right. Back to the Shaft quote. Shaft was portrayed by Samuel Jackson in a 2000 film, if you recall, and Samuel Jackson is Nick Fury in the Avengers universe, so it all ties together. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It also ties to band. Features the same actor who plays Pop. Uh, so does that mean SWAT is in the MCU? Stop it! <laughs> Get him out of the call. <laughs> <laughs> It's like poetry. To quote George Lucas, it's like poetry. It rhymes. Yeah, it's it's like it's all it's like poetry. It all rhymes. (laughs) (laughs) See, Jar 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 is the key to all of this. He's like a Christ figure. So Connor can be Stanley and George Lucas. (laughs) I'm not gonna argue. I'm just gonna just move on. (laughs) Anyways, (laughs) um. But uh, how does episode two start? Um, uh, bu- 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 bu. kind of flows from the first one, it, like it's just immediately afterward. If I kind remember. Of picks up. Is it? Is it? Yeah, in, in uh, the, um, in the this it, is when Chico is being uh, sought after by uh, oh, yeah, Cottonmouth. Yeah. yeah, he gets uh, what's so, starts with an S. Shades? shades? Not Shades. Did he... Uh, it's S- Oh, uh... Um... Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Shamik. Shamik. Yeah, it's right... Yeah. He gets his hands on Shamik. And, and, and the 500 oh, yeah, this grams. Is the episode... Yes, this is the episode with the Biggie scene. The Biggie yeah. painting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's right. Cottonmouth finds Shamik, gets his half of the money from the drug deal that went wrong. Uh, but Chico's still out on the limb. Um, the, I, the, I just have to talk about this now that I brought it up. That entire sequence is mesmerizing. Yeah. yeah uh, because it lingers on the Biggie painting, and you don't actually, like, Cottonmouth comes into frame about halfway through, I think, what he's saying. And then this this notorious B.I.G. painting is huge, and you get the crown on his head, and it's dominating most of the frame. And then Cottonmouth walks closer and closer and closer to the camera until it looks like the crown on Biggie's head is on his head. And he finishes it with, everybody wants to be the king. I'm like, this is awesome. Yeah. This is the... If you're a film nerd, I think the, this show is the best of all the Marvel Netflix shows. It's... Yeah. I tweeted it's this. As far as composition of shots and just, like, filmmaking craft... I think it's the best of all of them. It's yeah, I just I like cot. Whenever Cottonmouth is being Cottonmouth, like in his uh, environment, the lighting is always very particular. Oh yeah, and you can you can tell where you are just based on the lighting. Yes. You don't even need to really see most of the surrounding; just a little tiny piece, and you get it. Like, and this was it was all uh, red lit, and um, he's looming over Shamik the entire time, and. Um, uh, that one line where he's he's basically backhanding him over and over again, like his face is cracked and bloody. Um, and Shamik splits blood at, blood at him, and he's like, "Thank you. Now I can hit you like a man." Yeah. Yeah. Um, back to what you were saying about the the room being like uh, red. It's like the club is very like open and kind of like it's got all these nice colors and like, but that back room is like red and kind of like confining feeling. Like it's claustrophobic almost. And if there's a tonal difference between what's being shown in the club and in that back room, which is really yeah. nice. Yes. No, uh, Cottonmouth's room is very uh, sinister looking. Yeah, I, re- I just really like that. It's it's just like, it's fascinating, like the, how the lighting changes the club, the club and the back room. Is this the first villain's lair that we've had? Like. I mean, Fisk no. had a 
his apartment, oh, but it was a lair. Uh, the, well, F- Fisk's the, apartment was also very telling of himself because it, it was all, um, it was very, like when he's staring at the white painting, Yeah, uh, it was very much in tune with like his whole apartment. Everything was very clean and kind of almost flat looking. Like everything was right. very um, kind of angular um, and very pristine. You can say the same thing about uh, Daredevil season two with uh, Punisher. Oh, the Punisher had a lair, kind of. Yeah, he did. He had sort of... It was a shitty apartment. apartment. Yeah. Which which very much reflects him and his gruffness and his just dirty... It just shows how much singular focus he has. Like, he doesn't care about his apartment where he lives. It's like, he just wants to kill. That's all he wants. Yeah. And I guess the hand had a lair, so never mind. The hand had that... (laughs) Yeah, 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 but yeah. like, but but uh, Cottonmouth's club has, uh, I think, an identity all of its own. Like every yeah. time, like you, like when you're thrown into a scene here, usually you're brought in with some kind of musical act, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, and a lot of the performances were very good. Like awesome, the, ever... music, the music in this show is fucking great. Yeah, like it's got a great soundtrack, and like there's one performance I particularly want to talk about, but I, I'll wait till we get to the episode. I think it's episode five, but I'll, I'll talk about it. Okay. Um, plot of this episode, they're looking for... Chico. Chico, yes. Yeah. Shamik gets beaten to death by Cottonmouth and dumped in the, the street. The first thing is, is uh, Pop calls him the favor from uh, Luke Cage that he owes him a favor. Like, guess Luke Cage owes Pop a favor. Oh, and yes. And Pop is going to use that favor uh, for Luke Cage to find Chico. And keep right. him, yeah, basically parlay um, him for, I guess, safe passage, give him the money and let Chico go. Yeah, we sort of get the origin story uh, more in depth with Cottonmouth and how he's related to Pop and uh, the father, right, of the boy. Of Chico. Of the... Well, Fredo. Yeah, Alfredo. Alfredo. That looks like Shades. Wait, what? He kind of looks like Shades a little bit. Yeah, he does. Or it's not. It's not him, but it looks. I, like I was confused for a second. I thought they were saying Shades was his father for a second. Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> but um, anyway, three there with that little like flashback sequence of Pop and uh, with the Kangol uh, and um, I forget the dude's name. Uh, Chico's father, Alfredo. Yeah, Alfredo. Yeah. No, 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 um, Alfredo. <laughs> God damn it. Anyways, yeah, I like how 90s that whole sequence is, like, yeah. that whole flashback. Like, they, they nailed the uh, period. I was, I, was, I was ready to see, like, Run DMC just, like, be crossing the other side of the street. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, that, especially with, like, Chico and, like, Shamik, and, like, in this episode, that when Shamik gets captured, like, he's at a, it's like, he's at a strip club. And, like, he, he's having the world's most aggressive lap dance, is the only way I can describe it. <laughs> like, the lap dance was kind of aggressive. Yeah, it was almost it was almost pornographic. Yeah. Um, um, I can think of a couple things so far in episode one that were kind of pornographic. I mean, yeah. This, Luke Cage is very sexy in these first two episodes, specifically. I feel like yeah, Luke Cage Mike is Cole the most Hill, aggressively rated our show of the three. Like Daredevil was violent, uh, Jessica Jones was violent, um, but the language is really never there. And this show is that there's lots of cussing. It's like the, the sexual content is like through the roof sometimes. Yeah, yeah. they even have a swear jar, which is nice. Yeah, the swear jar is awesome. <laughs> but um, I think that it's definitely totally different than Daredevil and Jessica Jones. It's it's very much like like we said. It's yeah. very night and day. Like these are different shows, kind of. Yeah, but you can you can see how they intersect. Yeah, and you feel it kind of like when Turk shows up, uh, and I think he does show up in this episode. I don't remember. He does he... that's what I was getting to. I got I got dropped a minute ago. Well, Turk and uh, Fish are playing chess, and even in episode one, right. And yeah, and he's the one who kind of again. This is where someone gets the ball rolling. 
uh, Turk sells Chico out to Cottonmouth about where he is. Yeah. No, 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 yeah. not Cottonmouth, Tone. Oh, yeah, he, yes, he tell. tells Tone. I, I, and I love Turk. Who is not long for this world. Yeah. <laughs> Turk is I love how Turk is always... This is the first time I've seen him where he's not getting into a shitload of trouble. Yeah. But, like, he's, like, he's really funny, but, like, he... He's kind of a piece of shit, but he's likable. Yeah, yeah, just like, I think the last time I saw Daredevil beat him up, like, Daredevil shows up, and he's like, come on, dude, I just got out. Yeah. I just love then, how Daredevil leaves him there. Yeah, and then Daredevil, like, <laughs> doesn't he break his hands and just, like, leave? He he leaves his hands in a car, in a car <laughs> trunk. Wait. And he just leaves him stuck there. Doesn't he throw and his he... keys into the river? Yeah. <laughs> So he's gonna get arrested, and his hands are broken. And he, yeah, he's not, he's not happy. The last time we saw him, no. I, now he's he's up in Harlem pay, playing chess now, and like, gotta stay the hell away from Hell's Kitchen. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I get yeah. Turks uh, sells Chico out to Tone, who decides to, uh, as to quote Cottonmouth, feel himself. <laughs> Context yeah. is important here. Um. Yeah. Not literally. Um, and takes it upon himself to go track Chico down, and this is where uh, everything kind of hits the fan real fast. This yeah. is this is the, the crucial turning point of, like, this is what sets Luke Cage and Cottonmouth on a head-on collision. Yeah. And it's only in episode two. Yeah. yeah. It gets there quick. And I like how we learn a lot in this episode, like... We learn a lot about shades and how um, how thoughtful he is at what he does, and he's well, very—he's just saying you, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't you? Sh- you should have waited. You should have waited. Uh, and you yeah, just, this is where you kind of you, you learn there's a code uh, that like while like Cottonmouth uh, shade they're criminals, but like there are rules to this, and I think that's actually literally what Cottonmouth says at one point. He's like, you believe it or not, there are rules. Right, and we also and get one a, of them is like, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, we also get a uh, flashback scene to something that we'll talk about soon. When when Luke goes to deliver the message to Cottonmouth. Oh yeah, when he sees sh- Shades. Yes, oh, we learn that Shades and Luke have some kind of history. Yeah, and it doesn't seem to be a good one. No, but back to the rooftop scene of. Well, we kind of glossed over um, what exactly happened to the barbershop. Um, sat, uh, gone too soon, Pops is shot by Tone, who unloads uh, with two Uzis into the barbershop, wounding yeah. Chico, killing Pops. Uh, Luke Cage throws himself onto a, uh, a child, Lonnie, who was getting his hair cut. Yes. Yeah. The whole time I was just saying, why didn't you save Pops? Yeah. <laughs> well, going back to Luke Cage throwing himself over a, a child, that that just shows who the kind of man Luke Cage is. Like, yeah, he's, he and it's what he's, like, he's a great dude, but pop, <laughs> yeah, pops. Yeah, but... I mean, I, I I miss pops. Like, miss you, B. Well, this was no win. It's, morally speaking, this is no win. He he jumps for pops, and the kid dies. He jumps for the kid, yeah. and pops dies. So this is a Kobe Yashi Maru situation. And, yeah, it's uh, a Kobe Yashi Maru. And, 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 Kobe Ashi- wanted them, and, he's, and you he's can't. And Kirk's himself. not here to cheat the system. So, but uh, Tone, the, there's something like when Tone Tone is basically doing this for himself. He's he's not yeah because it'll make himself he thinks it'll make him look yeah. great and then it totally backfires and he takes a one way trip down a building yeah he's not he's you can collect your money <laughs> from the gentleman downstairs how did how did you get up here I'm Turk Bennett <laughs> <laughs> uh, we kind of we kind of over, stepped over the uh, final words of pops. Swear oh. to me. Always Swear forward. Me. He said always forward. Well, first he... he said, Luke Cage yells, someone get a goddamn ambulance, and Pop says, swear jar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Because all I heard was swear, and I immediately started doing Christian Bills. Swear to me! But, That's yeah. pretty... 
yeah, a good, great character moment for Pops. Um, and yeah, this is basically where we get the. So you compared to Uncle Ben before. This is where we get the with all, with great power comes great responsibility with the go with the always forward thing. Yeah, always forward, which I've been repeatedly saying to everybody who will listen to me because I'm a crazy person and I work all day just like looking at people in the eyes and be like, always forward. Always forward, forward. Always no, Hunter, forward. that's because, forward. Hunter, that's because you have mastered the art of beating a joke to death. That's true. <laughs> I have. He's the skeleton man, Connor. Yeah. Okay. I'm the only one. <laughs> it's the only one I've really enjoyed so far. I'm not appreciating the the SWAT nonsense, but anyway. All right, this, I'm I'm almost done with SWAT. <laughs> Trust me. Oh, great! Another six more weeks of SWAT. Um, yeah. So Tone boasts about having recovered the money, but in the end, he he basically and he laughs off Pop's death. Basically, says like, "Oh, it happened," and then Cottonmouth chucks him off a building, and it was awesome. Yeah. Which which says a lot about Cottonmouth too. Like, I don't, he was mad. I don't... He was furious. Yeah, like he 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 kind of I think he cared for pops. Like he he like, did because he, before he even he knows he's like he's like he's like I he's like I will sell this. He's like I will pay for that barber shop. He's like I will neg- he's like I'll fix everything with pops. He's like you messed this up. He's like no, this is, it's you know there's friendship there. And then Tone's like ah he's dead. And then pop, and Cottonmouth's like <laughs> so are you. <laughs> yeah. And which is again I like when when villains have. Um, uh, qualities outside of uh, I'm a bad guy. Yeah, he, yeah. he he's not a sociopath. Which he is, has a code. Yeah. Which is probably and even, even and we, he, he's going to be compared to Fisk, and I think even Fisk had something where you could look at him and go, he is human because he was very frail and very shy and timid and um, he, he, he loved like, Vanessa. Like, Vanessa nervous was, around his Nervous around the woman that he loved with everything he had, like he stammered around her, and she made him weak. Like yeah. he, he would destroy a world for her just because, like, he's so enamored with her. Yeah, yeah. he's. I I love that these Netflix characters are very human. I, I feel like Kilgrave wasn't really human. He just he's kind of like this space alien the kind power. of guy. Well, he was like I, to... I think the, the problem, the, the difference between Kilgrave, Fisk, and Cottonmouth is like. Like I said, Fisk and Cottonmouth have very... They have sort of a moralistic quality. And Kilgrave, I think, intentionally was supposed to be just, like, just gross. Yeah, yeah. Just, that's like, how he was written. There's nothing, nothing likable about Kilgrave, and that was the point. Like, he, his powers were, uh, you know, the power of suggestion, and, like, he uses it in the most devious ways. It just makes your skin crawl. Yeah, yeah. he used it for himself. Like, that's but he all he does. He didn't see himself. what was wrong about it, and I that's what I think made him an interesting character. He didn't get what right and wrong were. No, yeah. He, yeah, ultimately he's a product of, a, of his crazy-ass parents who screwed him up. Yeah. Um, but I think as far as this episode goes, um, I think this is like kind of where it all begins and ends, really, the rooftop. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, no, I mean with the, uh, I mean the barbershop and everything. Yeah, it's a shop heard around the world. Yeah, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, I it guess this is where Papa. where uh, sexy Will Graham gets suspicious of Cage. Yeah, at first because he, he takes like eight bullets and he just he just sitting there just seething <laughs> with hate. Yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah, this sort of lead. This episode leads into episode three, and uh, they do very. They do don't they? Do, I don't know what the film or the movie making name for it is, but it's it starts. Oh, in media res is what you're talking about. Yeah, that's what happens in the, in the, with this episode. It starts with Luke Cage being held at gunpoint. Uh, he he looks like he's jogging or something. He has headphones in. Mm-hmm. And the, and uh, the the young the young the young outstanding citizen the young lad yeah the young lad with the gun call calls him a very a word we can't say none of us no. can say nope nope That's something we need that to find out say it for yeah. us and I have news for everyone it says it gets says a lot in this show <laughs> yeah say. yeah if you have a problem with that word don't watch yourself but, and um, but Luke Cage says um he don't call goes. Me that. Uh, and he says, "This right across from us is a building named after one of our greatest heroes." 
Yeah. And that, you're going to sit here and call speech. me that? I love how... He, okay, this is just me talking about how I love this show, but um, Luke Cage is this guy who... He, he's a black man who who takes pride in his culture. And I really, like, he he doesn't use that word. He doesn't really curse. He He's just, he's an upstanding citizen who happens to be having a really shitty week, it seems. He yeah. he finds the, he also, I think, just by, with these speeches, because there's more than one, he finds the presence of this kind of scummy criminal activity in this, like you said, a very historic piece of New York, a very important city, he finds the criminal presence to be completely abhorrent, and he likes yeah. to remind people. He's like, he's like, you know where you are and what you're doing, and where, like, and what legacy you're spitting all over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like you're in Harlem, like you're you're spitting on our culture, and, and I think that's, I think that's really like it's really moving, and like I think that's what makes this a great character. Is just even in like un like terrible terrible conditions he he still has his morals and he still loves his city and he's still like he's just a great man it's just he's yeah. a great hero but anyways he, he was it starts out with him being held at gunpoint and it kind of flashes back to the events of the day yeah and then we ended that note too and then he also he once again demonstrates his his awesome superpower I like. I just like the idea of like a man going like, "I will show you," and then he takes a gun and he lifts his shirt and he shoots himself in the stomach. And just the and entire just bounces off. The entire <laughs> visual is so strange. And the kid and the kid just goes, "Fuck this! I'm out." Yeah, <laughs> I'm done. I'm. Yeah. I'm done. I'm leaving. I'm leaving Harlem. I'm leaving New York. I'm leaving the country. But how did this? It start after that. I forgot my notes. Um. Um, but, so, well, episode three, we go to Pop's funeral. Oh, no, that's episode five. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no I'm sorry. I read this wrong. Uh, we there, the funeral arrangements are happening. That's right. That 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 is true. Because we sort of we go back to that moment of the boy, and then we do before then. Uh, we see throughout the day Luke starting to tear Cotton Mouse organization apart. Oh, Sorry. this is the f- yes. This is where we can talk about furniture because the opening of this episode is a is a couch being chucked at a window. Oh, holy <laughs> shit! Can we talk about how this has the best use of the Wu Tang Clan? Like that. I song. was just talking. I I sold this show to one of my doctors at work today by telling him that alone. I was like, this show has the main character put in Wu Tang in his ears and take down at like a weapons dealer warehouse. He's like, get out of here. I was like, totally with a couch. Happy. With a couch and a car door. He swings a couch at some it, do, uh, people. It looked like someone, a real-life cosplayer, doing Dead Rising. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it, yeah, it does. But that whole sequence, like, is just... I like It's like the hallway fight from Daredevil. Like, yeah. It's just really tight corridors, and he's just knocking people out. Like, he's breaking limbs. Well, we'll get to that. With that's that entire sequence plays out after um, what I, I thought was uh, again we, we go to the uh, the funeral arrangements where Cage where, and Cottonmouth seemingly have their first kind of face to face. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. Where, Cage, really, yeah. And this is where Cage basically tells him he's like he's like this all falls on you. I don't care who pulled the trigger. And he he agrees to pay for the funeral, right? Yeah, he does. Yeah. Yes, because he's because again, this is where Cottonmouth again has a code, morals, and a soul. I guess underneath all that nastiness, he's like, he's like, this is he's like, I don't agree with this. I didn't want this to happen. Yeah. But um, I think that again, that these characters have an interesting relationship where they they're constantly being put in situations where they have to be interact, but they can't kill it, like rip each other apart, like. The the like in this scene where they're doing the funeral, it's their first interaction. But you you can kind of feel the tension a little bit. Cage there's, there's... Cage could grab Stokes by the head and smush him with yeah, like, no effort, and he just stands there. Yeah. Like, at any moment, like that, it could just turn. That's but why I like this can't... show because you have. I think someone brought this up. I was playing uh, Dark Souls a few weeks ago, and someone's like. How do you make a show where your character is virtually invincible? 
I was like, hey, he's mostly invincible, but like he can. The drama around him is like is is actually that it's around him. He, it, all this stuff unfolds uh, in his vicinity and not quite to him. You can you can't really hurt him, but you can hurt him emotionally. Yeah, and, and that I think once that's established in the show, that <clears throat> the stakes are going to be more emotional. It's far easier to believe Cottonmouth is a villain because I for months said, I, I don't see how Cottonmouth is going to work. I don't see how him just being a normal guy is going to work against somebody who's invincible. But those emotional stakes, they work a lot better than I would have thought in the beginning. You mean like when he shoots a rocket launcher into a little Chinese lady's restaurant? Oh now my god. <laughs> <laughs> I, la- that- I laughed. Like, I see- when he popped up... <laughs> Wait, are you saying that there wasn't well, I was the like, scene I was like, from Blues I, Brothers? I, I was... Oh, wait, go ahead. Were you saying that wasn't the scene from Blues Brothers where Carrie Fisher <laughs> showed up and shot the bazooka into a uh, hotel? Oh, shit, uh, that is exactly similar. the same scene. There is something very hokey and kind of campy about, like, a villain, like, a, a comic book villain going, ha ha, and then taking in a missile launcher. It, it felt very justified to me. I mean, the whole show has felt very justified, but it, it reminded me of Boyd Crowder uh, and his introduction. Powder? What was, it, what was the line? Fire, something in the hole? Oh, yeah, fire, fire, fire in the hole. He It opens with him... Attacking, I think a church. I can't remember a black church. A black, yeah, attacking a black church with a rocket launcher. What you shouldn't do? No, no, you should never do that. You should attack any no. rocket launcher. But I'll try that. If you, you are gonna, ki- if you are gonna kill anyone, let it be Ku Klux Klan members. Which can do, three. yeah, which can do Mafia Three. three. <laughs> Arlen ended up at the show. <laughs> We don't need Nazis attacking the, uh, the <laughs> dynamic. Uh, anyway, man, we're, we're our second episode. We're already like hot take. Anyway, um, we need the views, guys. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Controversy <laughs> creates cash. All right. Hashtag <laughs> take podcast straight again. God damn it! Anyways, <laughs> my impressions no no bounds. Um. um anyway, so episode lived. four. <laughs> well, actually, not in, we, in this episode. Yeah, we, we, we find cover, out. I guess. Yeah, go ahead. We find out that scarf is dirty. Oh yeah, yeah. he he's the one who actually Courage. kills Chico. Yeah. Yes, he garrots him after basically saying like, "Hey, let's meet." Um, and kind which of, actually kind of surprised me. I didn't see that coming. Because Surpri- well, moments before that, he's he's basically. He's condoning everything Cage does in a very convincing speech. He's like, he's like, I hate paperwork. He's like, and we're slaves to a system. And you're telling me that this guy who is bulletproof can walk into a uh, a, a a crime den, uh, dismantle it, and leave no dead bodies whatsoever. He's like, you're trying to tell me that's a bad thing. He's like, I think you're nuts. Yeah. Wait, is this the episode where we learned Misty Knight uh, created the WNBA? Uh, what? That Misty Knight is really good at ba- basketball. I think that, that was oh that was... yeah, she plays she plays horse with the kid right because they're looking for Chico right. Yeah, yeah. Or was that yeah. last episode? I think that I think was, was previous was... previous episode. Yeah, yeah. I, we've, I just... we've we've hardly touched on Misty Knight, um, which I think we should. Um, yeah. She really is. She's she's super cop. Um, she's like you said. She's good at basketball. She's <laughs> yes. She's a. Uh... She's also very persistent. Like, she, there's really no stopping her from achieving yes. her goals. And we totally we glossed over her uh, big interaction with Cage is that they slept together in the first episode. Yeah, um, they fucked. And, yeah. she, and my, she told him that both, she was an auditor. An auditor, yes. And then he finds out she's an officer later on. And they're yeah. both very sexy. Like, that's that's what we learned about them. Yeah. My, it, my Coulter is the most handsome man on earth. I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> Yeah, he is. Uh, he is a he's a smooth motherfucker. Um, yeah, he, let's let's move to the origin of Luke Cage, the the secret yeah, order. Well, do we want do we want to dwell on the um the attic uh, Christmas attic uh, action sequence for a minute? Sure. Um, he grabs that car door and just saunters in like it's just, like whatever. He pops his Wu Tang in and 
Like, what, he walks up the staircase and, like, folds the car door over somebody. He, like, casually reaches through a wall and grabs a piece of pipe and throws it at somebody. Um, and again, he's he's not really, he's not killing anyone. He's, he's barely injuring people. He's just, like, knocking everybody over. He's like, excuse me, pardon me. <laughs> I have things to do when you're all the way. Why did, he, and, why did he need the car door? Um, Clothes, I guess? I think that's, yeah, that's probably because, like, I used it's close, still got shot up. up. This is very true. Um, also, it kind of works as a weapon. Because you could just, like, outside of using your hands, you could basically use that as a plow and just start pushing people oh, over. Luke Cage, I believe, in episode four, I am the gun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is the yeah. best line. I love that line so much. Um, and then this all culminates with him picking up a couch and swinging at ten people and throwing it out the window. And that's where our first shot of the episode came from. Yeah. And then, yeah, he basically dismantles this um, this crime den. He steals a was, bag of money, leaving the rest of the fleet to confiscate. So in this episode, he's essentially dealt a massive blow to Cottonmouth's uh, empire, and I, it, I think almost makes him broke. Yeah, he. I think it was like two hundred fifty thousand walking in. The final, final money. Yeah. Yeah, he walks in, walks out, like, and that's kind of where we establish that Cage is one very determined, and like he can hurt Cottonmouth in places that count. Right, but then immediately, almost immediately afterwards, we learned that what we just said before is that Cottonmouth will resort to things like collateral damage and shooting a missile into a restaurant. Yeah, which takes us right to the next episode, episode four, a flashback episode to his origin story, which we're very familiar after watching every single episode of Arrow. This was very Arrow esque, actually, because they kept showing like shots of the um, the prison on an island. I was like, what show am I watching? <laughs> Seagate, which is, uh, I think that's in the comics. It, it, Seagate, it is. which has which has nothing to do with Blackgate. I'm assuming. No, no. Blackgate is DC property. I that was the joke. Seagate, I believe, is based off of Alcatraz. I believe it. Yes, there. Are, there's also like there's also very, something very fishy going on at Seagate. That like Riva Riva says um, that there's no. I promise you, there's no experience. Going and on, then he gets experimented on. Yeah, which is code for their totally experiments going on at Seagate. She's like, no, yeah. <laughs> um, but actually, you name drop Reva. This is important because this is where we figure out where we meet Reva, who sadly died, I guess, over the course of Jennifer, uh, Jessica Jones. In a flashback scene. In a yeah. flashback sequence. Yeah, the timeline for that is, is fuzzy. I, I'm having trouble remembering exactly when that all took place. Um, um I probably watched it the most recently, of, and she. So, when Jessica oh, no, got out of the mind control, let me interrupt real quick. Seagate Federal Penitentiary was the maximum security prison off the coast of Georgia, which is where Luke Cage says he is from. When he is asked, "Where are you from, boy?" Georgia. Yeah, but oh, nice. uh, yeah. So we see in a flashback, Jessica kicks Kilgrave out of her mind after killing Riva. Uh, on a cold February day, it looks like. And that's sort of where the show begins with a lot of... Because you do see that throughout the first episode and throughout Jessica Jones. And Reva is very important to who Luke Cage is. Yeah. Because that is Pop's daughter, too, by the way. Um... But yeah, the 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 experiments like the prison sequence is probably it's the most interesting because he gets he gets the the class, very classic Luke Cage fro and like you learn yeah, like, you learn that he was in a fighting ring. Yeah, everything has an explanation where he kind of like he gets his big fro because he's just he's like fighting and not bathing and not shaving because he gets. Long story short, he gets wrapped up in a prison fighting ring, um, and then he's forced to fight, or I guess the guards will uh, hurt basically the friends he has in prison. Squabbles being one of them. I love there. Squabbles! Squabbles is great. <laughs> squabbles is my boy. He's the pretty... interaction between them two, where he's basically talking to him about training, and then he's like a... He, he mentions that he prefers the remake starring Jet Li of um, uh, Chinese Connection. He's like, you prefer Lee, uh, Jet over Bruce? You can't be my trainer. 
which I thought was interesting because of the whole um, the hip hop Wu Tang element uh, and their influence from like old kung fu movies. I thought was very funny. But yes, this fighting ring basically brings out a, a very animalistic side of Cage, and this is kind of where we see how much of an adept fighter he is. Yeah, it's where he he, he kind of loses himself in the fighting ring, where he's just like he kind he kind of becomes this kind of like very vitriolic me- person who loves to like just beat skulls in all day. And this is also and he's where, good at it. Where we find yeah, he's out very good at it. where uh, where Shades comes back into the story. Yes, this ties into where we see him in episode two. I believe was where Shades was. He was an inmate there, right? Yeah. Yeah, and he's kind of in on the whole fighting ring. Um, back and ob- the- obviously this whole place is crooked. Yes, he's been there for quite a while. It seems. Back before he, Luke Cage was, was Luke Cage, when he was Carl Lucas. Yeah, another important thing is that Luke Cage is a fake name. Um, but anyway, so yeah, this fighting ring kind of takes over Cage's existence for a while, and as I think he, once he exposes it, Squabble sadly dies. R.I.P. Oh, yes. Skulls died in a very like kind he, of like was, uh, was he beaten to death. He was oh no, death, he's right? dead. What? Yeah, off screen deaths they they tend to not be the most memorable things because you're like, no. huh? and then it just never mentioned again. Yeah. He deserved uh, to have the a fanfare go off. I was yeah. I was hoping they would like shoot him with a rocket launcher and he would explode or something. <laughs> Is this Punisher Warzone? <laughs> yes, please. Well, the director you... of Warzone did direct an episode of Arrow last season. Uh... Oh, please tell me there's a rocket launcher scene. That's like, uh... Mm. Anyway. I think that... Yeah. That no, was we can't. Real quick. You're... You guys are opening up old wounds. Yeah. I'm very upset about it. Um, <laughs> um, the Luke Cage um, buddy, like, that was in prison with him, like, I, if I recall correctly, that was actually William Stryker, who was Diamondback. So, like, I was I was hoping, like, the whole time that somehow Squabbles just turns into Diamondback or something like that. But that never happened. That, that nope. would be... So, I guess after he exposed this fighting ring, uh, Shades and who else? I can't Some who random was. guy who we don't... Yeah, yeah they... Name. They, I can't remember his name. They beat Cage basically near death. Um, and this is where we get his actual kind of superpower origin story where they basically Deadpool him. Um, yeah, it, lo- it's, it looks very similar to the... It might be the same prop, actually. I wouldn't be it's surprised. A, it's, on, it's only referred to as the, the bath. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very... And much like um, Daredevil and Jessica Jones, it, the kind of... I guess the science fiction behind it is very muddled. You don't really know much about it. Um, well, it's supposed to cause him to heal. That's what Reva says. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's how it was in the comics was it was like supposedly to heal and then the guard dude uh, tries and kills Luke Cage and break the machine. Um, and but then he's, turn him he's a, a dumb... Superhero. He's a dumbass and just kills himself. Yeah, he yeah, has been blown up and crushed by the thing he tries to stop and destroy and just gets flattened against the wall. Um, and this is where Cage emerges with his massive fro and his little adorable silver helmet and his, his, Ciara, little, and his, little, uh, his little wrist thing with jigs and I and stole the wrist bands which are like a child. And then what later he finds a yellow um, sweater. Or... A, a yellow disco uh, shirt yeah. and back yeah, pants yeah. on a clothesline and he says he, Sees himself in reflection and says, you look like a damn fool. And then he takes it off. <laughs> takes it off. I wish he would have just worn it for a little bit longer. I did, the, just the fact that they put that in there in kind of a short... Like, there's season. so many little, like, nods and little, like, giggles As soon as, as, soon as he had the helmet on, I was like, I, because, admittedly, Luke Cage is not something I'm too well-versed on, but, like, as soon as the helmet popped up, I was like, you guys are geniuses. And then, like, I saw the wrist things, I'm like, this is fantastic. And then the yellow shirt, I'm like, oh, come on, guys, you're just showing up at this point. <laughs> well, for the longest time, though, in the 70s, for, I want to say, like, six, like, six issues or whatever of uh, Captain America, um, Luke Cage was basically Bucky Barnes. He wore the blue and the um, red tights. It was great. 
God. Wait, really? Yeah. yeah. Are you being serious right now? I, I'm not issues, lying. Yeah. It is true. That's awesome. Did he meet Cap Wolf at any point? Um, I don't think so. Oh my god. <laughs> I have Hold to speak with you guys after the, the podcast about something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's kind of, and then, yeah. yeah, Cage gets out, um, and all while this is happening, these flashback sequences, we are still in, in the present, we are in the rubble with, um, Cage and Connie, the his landlady, owner of the restaurant, they're both have survived. Him, obviously, her leg is broken. Um, and this is where Cage drops the very casual line. He's like, "I'm kind of strong," and they just start moving debris. <laughs> well, yes. there's a scene where they flash back and flash forward to to uh, the prison. What? Yeah. And it, and it's him punching. Is Punch- that what you're talking about? Yeah, him punching through the through the wall and then through the going flashing back or flashing forward, punching the debris. Yeah. And it's, it's really well done. The music is perfect. It's not overdone, but not uh, uninteresting or un, or non-stirring. It's, it all works together very well. Yeah. Yes, and that was basically... Yeah, and then uh, Cage basically saves Connie. Um, he digs himself out of the rubble. I guess this is where he... Unlike... Uh, well, now, Jessica Jones becomes public sort of at the end with her whole killing Kilgrave thing. Daredevil never shows himself to the the public eye, and this it, Luke Cage gets out in front of a TV, gets in front of a camera, and says, "I'm Luke Cage," um, and basically reveals himself as a neighborhood hero. Yeah. And this episode—that's the end of the episode, right? That's when. Yeah, basically. Yeah, this is. It was yeah. a much like uh, uh, Kingpin's episode in Daredevil, where it's. Yeah. There's lots well, of stuff happening in the present, but you it, you spent a lot of time in the past. Yeah. Well, we have one of those in four, Matt, also. I think it's episode six or seven with Stick. And I always like the origin episodes the best, I think. They're usually yes. the best done and the most interesting. because you're I, just think, I think when any show pulls the focus off of the grand narrative for a little bit and on one person you get some very quality stuff. And actually, and I give Walking Dead a lot of shit, but the episodes... It's so. The, yeah. Mm, um, the episodes about... The episodes centering on the governor in season four are two of my favorite episodes in the entire show, as oh, well as the episodes with Morgan in season six. But the governor episodes are tremendous. Those are the last great episodes I remember before I jumped off. But So, yeah. They were so good, because... Because you get a it, short, long story short, you get a villain who is totally out on his ass, who has a redemption arc, and then completely blows it, and you're like, "Fuck, Jesus!" Like it's an awesome little like just tale of watching him fall, rise, and then tragically fall again. And I thought putting the spotlight on him for a few episodes was brilliant. And then again, th- these shows do a great job of those when they pull the the when they put the microscope on one person in particular, and you you learn more about them. Can't yeah. wait to see them do that for Negan. You mean when season seven premieres and we don't get to see who dies? Yeah, I will. I will scream from the fucking rooftops if that show does it, and I will tell everyone I told them so. Anyway, but you'll still watch. So, bringing it back to Netflix, I can't wait <laughs> for this because uh, I guarantee we will have an episode in the Punisher's spinoff where it's him and that it's that story that his uh, old general tells from the courtroom. I can't wait to see that. Oh, don't even... Oh, I'm so aroused right now. <laughs> I love the Punisher Hunter so that, much. Hunter is at half mast. I just finished... Oh, no, I didn't finish. I'm <laughs> reading Punisher Max, and it's all very good. Um, but, uh... Yeah, I was basically... We get to episode five. Um, oh, and it starts out with the, the, the music performance by Jaidina. J- I can't remember his name. Cut to and, Rosario Dawson being amazing, awesome being night nurse. Beating, the return beating, of night nurse beating the shit out of a purse snatcher, which was just just <laughs> hilarious. I just, like how he grabs the purse and then she's like motherfucker, and she just takes off after him. And then like he sees that she's after him, and he's like, oh god. <laughs> and doesn't he call her a bitch when she's beating beating him up? I, yeah, I think, and then she hits him harder. I think she kicks him in the nuts. <laughs> yeah. And then her mom's like, you know, it's dangerous, right? And he's, she's like, yeah, I really wanted my bag. 
Um, I'm glad we got to see her back because I love her character. Um, because she seems yeah, to, especially in Daredevil, she was always like, "You're an idiot! Like, stop being so stupid!" Right. She's the Coulson. She's the Coulson of the <laughs> Netflix verse. Yes. Um, she's she's think, more often than not the voice of reason, and seems to be the one who always kind of uh, the, she's always the cooler head that prevails. Yeah, she, yeah. She, she's not afraid to tell friggin' Daredevil to knock his shit off. <laughs> Stop being a bitch, Matt. Quit being yeah. a shithead, Matt. God. <laughs> God damn it. And hey, that role we... has gone to Foggy. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Foggy. And it always Foggy. will be. I think Foggy... I'll, I'll get into it when Daredevil comes back, but... Um, it, I, uh, back to Rosario Dawson, though, but... Uh, her character... She's Night Nurse, right? Like, I keep saying Night yeah. Nurse, but... Well, very, she's, she's not. Well, here's the problem. She's not officially. I'm sorry. I have to rebuttal. Um, he is not Bucky. He is actually a battle star. Oh, that's an even worse name. Um, oh yeah, battle star. I, I mean, I mean, battle star is Bucky. Luke Cage has nothing to do with it. I was confusing yeah. superheroes. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, me. yeah, she's night nurse, and I guarantee. That the way the defenders are gathered is she gets a she gets some sort of lead on the hand and then she just calls all of them, asks all of them to go there and then they meet there. I guarantee. I think she's she's so far been the solid connective tissue because um, at the end of Jessica Jones, I believe she is the one who basically tells her he's like, yeah, I kind of she sort of mentions Daredevil to Jessica. Yeah, um, she, I have a friend who could help, but. And then she, her response is, uh, I don't want to get anybody else involved in this. We don't need another weapon against us. Yeah. Um, now, her character's great. Although, you mentioned Night Nurse. Uh, I heard that there is another version of Night Nurse who's, I think, going to be officially Night Nurse in Doctor Strange, played by Rachel McAdams. Oh, really? That's yes. actually, like, really cool. Like, I'm the uh, four nurses in the comics, though. I don't know. There's, there's, there are five reverse flashes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so like, that's that's be real. It's there can be multiple night nurses. It can yeah. be. There's the, the, there are the main pool of night nurse. Right nurse now. is so heavy. <laughs> <laughs> heavy lies with uh, heavy who who those who wear the crown. I thought you were gonna make like an old timey like World War One bonnet reference to like nurse caps. <laughs> <laughs> but um. Heavy as a head who wears the cap. But, uh... Before she was a nurse, Sharon Carter was a night nurse for a second. Because she was a nurse. Uh, Uh, And moving on. Anyway, episode five. Um, If I'm not mistaken, this starts out with... uh, with This is where where Cottonmouth is like, I'm broke, go steal shit. Yeah. Uh, if, they have a, our... if they have a dime, I want a nickel. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And this is kind of where Luke Cage is. Responsible. This is where this is where Cottonmouth just starts to. Whereas you had Fisk, who had a slow uh, rise to ultimate power, you have Cottonmouth, who seemingly acts um, very irrationally and starts yeah. to trip up very fast. Yeah, he he's very emotional. Like he's like he he. But in in the same way, he's using, he's he knows Luke Cage is emotional too, and he's trying to like, he's trying to prod Luke Cage into into acting out. Kind yes. Of. Yeah. Sort of backfires on him because his uh, Cottonmouth thugs basically take lots of valuables and money from lots of people in the neighborhood, and they all run back to Cage saying like, "Hey, they're blaming this on you. They're saying this is your fault." Yeah. Um. Which and this is also this is this is the episode with Pops's funeral, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then, kind of. Misty tells ah. him not to go, but that's in like the middle of the episode. One of the things that uh, they actually do something that they didn't do in Dawn of Justice. I know it's not. This is Marvel, but. It's something that they failed to show doing in a Superman movie. Him sit, like 
doing stuff for the for, you, for the people. You mean him yeah, being he, a, yeah. you mean him being a superhero and actually saving people? Yeah. And smiling. Yeah. And being positive and yes oh. to everything. Can, can, <laughs> okay. Can we talk about how net uh, how Netflix introduced Dapper Dan? Oh yeah. How he like the um what are they um. Uh, Dapper Dan, what what team is he a part of? He's a vil- he's like a villain with, with like Ox, uh, Fancy Dan, Fancy Dan. Dapper Dan is is a Spider Man villain, I thought. Bro, you're going level seven deep on this Marvel stuff. Yeah, no, this this is Uh-oh, this, I swear. Oh, we're in deep nerd territory. Yeah. But... Oh, there's a there's a plot there's a plot line we haven't for ta- haven't we haven't talked about. Uh, Fish and uh, Luke talk about bu- buying the, uh, like, restoring the uh, barbershop. Yeah. Well, yes, that's right. Cage takes the money from the crime den he took down and gives it to Fish and basically tells him to rebuild the barbershop. Yeah. Basically saying, like, you know, none of us are barbers, but this this neighborhood needs this place to stay open. Yeah. Because there's and the scene, barbershop, the, the barbershop kind of becomes like uh, a haven, really. Yeah, the before, secret base. Before the uh, everything went down in episode two, or Pop said that it was a place for young kids to go t- to hang out, be anywhere but anywhere but the streets. Getting basically, it was there. He he let people in who needed direction, and he offered it to them. sweep hair, There's clean no windows, and stage drapes. There's no character, character named Dapper Dan. I, I, okay, I'm thinking of Fancy Dan. Obviously, I, I Google it, and I was like, I'm just gonna go past this because I got nothing. Um. So yeah, these thugs basically they run down the whole neighborhood, and Cage, before he goes to the funeral, kind of goes out and just more or less uh, undoes all of that. Fairly easy fashion, and uh, yeah, one of the guys, a guy gets shot. Oh, um, the the big fat dude. What's his name? Uh, he doesn't have a name, but he's the guy from. I, he's the guy from the Chinese shop. Yeah, who, a- Aisha, who whose father, who they stole her father's ring. He, he used to be a he's a, he was a baseball player. Yeah, yes. and they. And um, he had a problem, like I think he had a drug problem, or like a, he's an addict of some sort. And Alcoholic. Yeah. And Zip he, takes it, and uh... Aisha kind of goes Punisher almost, and just starts shooting people. Yeah. Yeah, because she seems to be the one, the one in the neighborhood who's, who's not afraid to act out, and everyone kind of comes to Cage like, hey, you know, you're fucking invincible, give us a hand. Um, what is that line? Doesn't he say when he goes into that guy's apartment and he says, oh, "Where's Les Paul?" Model. Where's Les Paul? <laughs> I laughed so hard at that part. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking guitar <laughs> stole my Les Paul. Where's Les Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I really hope it was like a Drax moment. I do. I. I do love the show has a sense of humor that it, I really like resonates with me kind of like it's very dry it, like the humor's there it's kind of dry like when he, when he gets shot up and he's like I'm getting real tired of buying new clothes <laughs> uh, just something about that just cracks me up yeah this is also an important episode because this is where we learn that there is a weapon out there that can hurt Cage oh the Judas yeah. use so, it, and this is where we said this is a very marvelly show especially the MCU it is devised from Chitari technology with with remnants from the attack on New York. Yep. Or is and it it's called also made by like Justin Hammer. The who also gives it... Which were introduced where they talk about in episode one when Luke is going by turning a turning a corner. Some you see the incident on a you see yeah. like the words the incident. He's selling DVDs. He's selling DVDs of of cameras capturing the basically yeah, like Avengers security footage, bootlegs version, bootleg versions of actual events, which yeah. I, I yeah, think would I, actually. I have a question for you guys. 
a friend of mine recently was playing, or a while ago, was playing Lego Marvel Super Heroes. Yep. And he was talking about, do you think in the MCU they make comics based off their superheroes? Well, maybe. Well, actually, I have an answer. In Captain America, the first Avenger, they show Captain America comics being made. Yeah. Yeah, they they do. And also in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., that very first episode, uh, Mike Peterson is buying uh, toys, and they have a whole toy line of, like, these are the heroes of New York. And it's just like, I I think that they they immediately started marketing these guys, which is kind of funny. Well, I mean, let's let's be realistic. If these people were real um, in our world, um, there'd be people lining up to make money off of them. They're, yeah. They'd be fucking sponsored. They'd be like Taco Bell, Iron Man. Iron Man's yeah. fucking suit would be covered in stickers. Yeah. It'd be the Booster Gold suit. <laughs> and one of them would have a reality show by this point. Uh, yes. and I think, like, you know what? I think it would be, be the Hulk and Thor. Yeah. You know, it'd be the, uh, and, uh, the Odd Couple starring Hulk and Thor. Yeah, and that's right. Only later, Hawkeye's children will have their own reality show. <laughs> oh, our dad is boring. <laughs> Shut up, Our mom Hawkeye. is Lindsay Weir. No, I love I love Jeremy Renner as Hawkeye. I'm, I'm just joking. But um, but anyways, episode, yeah. No, this is where we again we learn that there is a weapon out there that can hurt him, and this is kind of where Diamondback sort of starts to finally make his entrance because this is more or less, I guess. Well, how did this basically come into play? Um, Shade says that. It- if you want this to, if you want to go, if you want to go down this road, shade, uh, not shade, uh, Diamondback's gonna be taking over this your 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 hood. That's right. Yes, he will take Harlem from him. I think I believe the weapon was like extremely expensive too, and like Cottonmouth is so broke, it's not even funny. Yeah, the, that that the one moment where it's like Cottonmouth, Cottonmouth sees the, the price and he's like, for bullets? <laughs> like, oh, for one bullet? Well, so, the immediate reaction he sees the video of like the guy getting shot and. Blowing up like, the next letter, he's like, he's like, that is the real shit I've ever seen. And he's like, yeah, it's this much money. He's like, no thanks. But uh, I think it's also funny how Justin Hammer he still keeps up the theme of him giving stupid nicknames to his weapons. Like the, the board's called the Judas. Yeah. Because <laughs> I could just see Sam Rockwell like, because you know it it, uh, it killed Jesus, you know, right, <laughs> right, right, guys, right, right? Star- Tony, come back, give me a handshake. Just accept me, Tony. <laughs> But, um, and it's funny that the one thing that they tried to erase any knowledge of Iron Man to well, Hammer Technologies or Hammer Industries, anything from Iron Man Two. That's well, it. If, if by erase you mean ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist, then yes, uh, yeah. Yeah that's, yeah, that's what I mean. Or Whiplash. Anyway, um, yeah. nobody. My- Where's my bird? <laughs> I want my bird. I want my bird. Save that for the movie episode. This is not my bird. <laughs> but anyways, but anyways, um, the most dialogue yeah. But I think that the the uh, oh, what was I saying? Uh, when Cottonmouth is so like at this point, Cottonmouth has nothing. Like he has he has no money. He. <laughs> Luke Luke Cage publicly humiliates him. Like, yes, oh, we didn't cover. That. Oh, that, that's what we didn't cover the funeral. Uh, Cage, Cottonmouth makes a speech first, and then Cage basically. Says, no, 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 no. Cage, it was not so many... it was Pops's son, a biological son. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah, the the son starts it off, and then then before uh, Luke gets Cottonmouth up, Luke gets, gets up before Luke Cage does. And rushes over to the podium to do his thing, and then Luke Cage goes to the podium and then just demolishes. He just, he, without saying his name or even directly referencing him, he just rolls <laughs> over him um, and just walks away. And then having the satisfaction of publicly humiliating Cotton at this point, so he, yeah, like you said, he's not only made him broke; he's he can effectively crumble all of his operations in a single day if he really wants to, which he kind of does. Like he. He undoes an entire like neighborhood sweep that Cottonmouth does by just sauntering around, going like, "Give me that back! Give me that back! Give me that back!" Which is which is yeah. kind of funny in like in contrast to like how and going back to like Daredevil, like Daredevil it takes effort for Daredevil, Daredevil gets to, like, his 
Daredevil gets his ass kicked every yeah. fucking episode. This and is like, the best Luke Cage black Superman this... I've ever seen. <laughs> I was I'm thinking gonna... about that today, actually, Alan. You make a good point that Luke Cage is kind of Superman. Like he he's not as powerful or like strong, but he he kind of represents the same thing, and like he's the moral fiber. He represents yeah, the best moral fiber we can be. Yeah, he he just, and I think that's it's kind of important to to kind of remember that about him is that Luke Cage is the is has has his morals, and he's 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 like this. He's not this red blooded American like maybe Superman is portrayed to be, but he's. He's this dude who, who is someone you should strive to be. Like he's 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 a superhero. And I believe I think that Luke Cage, especially MCU uh, Luke Cage and MCU Captain America, would get along very well because they are very uh, they run the same parallel of like basically refusing to lower yourself to be nothing but the best you can absolutely be. Yeah. Right. I'm not going to spoil Agents of, Agents of Shield, but. They're, they do t- mention Steve Rogers in a role that is that he started did in the comics. So it, that's just something I want those of you who, who haven't seen Agents of Shield. Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I, I won't say it. But uh, I yes. don't. Now I now I have to go. You, you bastard! Now I have more TV. But uh, oh, you're like so to, hard. <laughs> I have to sleep at some point. I'm probably but, uh, I'm probably gonna watch especially. Gotham again. God damn it! Why did you wait? Wait! Show? Wait! 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 Again? Yeah. Hold because... on. No. That no. Means okay. More okay. than once. No. Stop. 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 How dare you mention Gotham in a Luke Cage show? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get out of here. <laughs> save your ground. <laughs> save your save your Gotham in your age of shield. How dare you this, this pure conversation? This episode. Episode. The stain talk with the stain yeah. of Gotham. <laughs> or as I call it, Schlockham. <laughs> Sherlock comes sounds like a show where Sherlock shows up, which would be Sherlock better. <laughs> I wish, but um, what if Batman was Sherlock Holmes? Oh God! <laughs> what if Iron Man was Sherlock Holmes? Oh, he was. I thought oh, you were doing a Bane impression there. <laughs> New from IDW. <laughs> oh God! Yes. Um. So, um. Episode and five, yeah, episode, episode, episode five <laughs> ends with uh... Uh, yeah, with the eulogy and Cottonmouth kind of running over, uh, uh, or no, Cottonmouth being run over by Cage. Also, yeah. Misty, Misty he... then wards Cage, and again, we, we're really glossing over a lot of Misty Knight stuff here. Um, I feel bad about it. Knight. Misty Knight warns Cage basically that declaring war on Cottonmouth is going to kind of have some negative. Yeah. Well, he actually first he get the first thing he does after he. Demolishes uh, Conmath. He gives Aisha back Eddie's ring. Yeah. Yes. And, and he stops her. Stops her from shooting. Uh, yeah. Stops her shooting Conmath. He reaches. Doesn't he reach into a purple crush her? Yeah. yeah he he's cr- this, um, that's why he's Superman. He's Christopher Reeve Superman, the best Superman. That's yeah. why he's not Punisher because he does everything he can to minimize the violence. He literally. Yeah. He crushed. He. he he, he, tur- put- he, he turns he loops it. Isn't it like the fourth gun in that episode too where he just grabs it and bends it into a fucking pretzel and he's like, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't think it, I, think, I, I was thinking like when he was crushing the gun, I was like, how weird must that be for like people watching? He's just like gripping her leg. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> he's like, what's going on over there? She's like, he just broke my femur. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we get to episode six. After Cottonmouth has been embarrassed, we go right to Cottonmouth attending this uh, gun from Scarf, who again has been tragically not mentioned. Oh, well, Scar- yeah, Scarf! Yes, um, Scarf. Scarf is dirty as fuck. Um, yeah. Scarf uh, gets the weapons for. Yes, for, yes. Uh, Scar- I think actually Scarf has a moment in episode five where he gets... Cottonmouth says, "Like, do you have the product?" And instead of answering him, he closes his phone. Because basically he's aware of that Pops' funeral is going on, isn't he? And Misty's there, too. That's, and Misty's I think there. That's part of it. So, and then he has a moment of clarity where he's like, this cannot happen right now. And he basically closes his phone, doesn't answer, and drives away. And doesn't yeah. basically return the phone call. And then the next episode, he, I guess, 
attempts to charge Cottonmouth uh, 100k. Yeah, 100 grand more. For or 100 grand weapon. extra. Yeah. Um, and Cottonmouth, in his probably biggest fuck up, decides to shoot a cop. Yeah. yeah. Cottonmouth, like, I do like how he's just he's just constantly fucking up. Like he's not he like Fisk. Fisk was like. He, he had this rise to power. He he can't. His, he was more gradual. Fisk, he con- Fisk didn't slip up and didn't even really slip up. He just got beat. Um, yeah. Fisk, until the last episode of season one, Fisk was seemingly yeah. un- even when they had him, he struck back. I mean, when they when they went and, and stabbed at Fisk's most vulnerable spot, which is his mother, he was like, "Oh, really? Well, I'm yeah. killing you, Ben." It, it was yeah. it was like the Death Star almost. They, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but uh, so I, I feel like we got to compare this to other mid seasons that they've done, and I think that this is the best. I because I... it's I I still have a soft spot for Daredevil being paired with that Russian guy and constantly having to beat him up and keep him safe. <laughs> that was, yeah, I love that episode. And then that, that dude, that, I can't remember his name, but that dude takes a beating for like two straight episodes like every other minute he's getting shot or punched or falling through a brick floor or getting chucked into a wall or daredevil's punching him just to keep him in check yeah <laughs> it's it's pretty great and then there's and then, he, and then he gets lit up by machine gun fire and like i mean at this point you just had to push him over and he might have died right and then the the one in jessica jones is her trying to catch Kilgrave, and you actually think that they're about to succeed you and uh he has like a security team following him, and they take him back. Uh, and that one's, I guess, that one's okay compared to this. Uh, I don't know what you would consider the mid-season for Daredevil season two. It's it gets it's, when it's, Punisher gets caught. Yeah, I, it's yeah, other, yes. Or it's the heist. Uh, it's one of those. It's so, it's between those two. It, I, well, comparing this to season two of Daredevil, which I I actually recently rewatched, um, I feel like. These these first arcs are so good, and like I love, like it, Daredevil introduced the Punisher, which is one of my favorite characters. But in Luke Cage, it's like it. I feel it's so much better because it's it's taking a character who's already like established, and it's just shaping him into like it's 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 filling in backstory that we need and like character moments and like it just. It's just very, very, very well put together. I think it's the Netflix shows are very intimate. Um, yes, yeah. I'm really hoping the uh, last part of the season is going to end off strong, yeah, um, and just continue to uh, build, as it were. I hope so too. I, I, yeah. I hope it keeps on keeps this momentum. Yeah, yeah. it's very. I it's mean, very good. If Daredevil season two is is any evidence, then yeah, they're just going to re- keep raising the bar. Um, but back to this episode. Uh, so yeah, Stokes. Cottonmouth shoots Scarf. Um, and then we learn there's a second dirty cop, uh, who is Perez. the other partner, Perez. Well, we learned no, that a uh, couple lieutenant. episodes ago, I believe, when they were talking about yeah, the you learn that You learn that he, he tells Scarf that uh, um, that he needs to get the guns. He's under, and yes. he's under investigation. Yeah, yeah. that's right, yes. Episode um, 5 of So then I guess uh, well, this is also where Scarf yeah, Scarf crawls at the barbershop. Um, yeah. Kind of pours his heart out to Cage and says, yeah, I killed, you know, I he was, he admits yeah. to working for Cottonmouth, admits that he killed Chico. Um, yeah. And then basically tells Cage that he says, I have everything you need to put Cottonmouth in jail. Yeah. And it, it's a very well done it's a sequence, I guess, because it's first it's Rosaria Dawson saving him and you see her pull a bullet out of his leg with uh, tweezers which was uh, harrowing um, yes well this, she also got a moment in this before this because this is where she tells her mother she's like I worked at a hospital where ninjas attacked killed one of my friends and the hospital covered up and fired and she says in that moment I figured out what I wanted to do was help these people who are all extraordinary she also yeah. mentioned that she got blacklisted by the hospital Yes, they won't let her work anywhere in New York. Yeah. And then Luke almost kills Scarf. Um, yes, yeah, as soon as he says he killed Chico, he starts to strangle him. 
And that's I, I I love that whole I just love that whole sequence of them in that barber shop because it keeps on changing the emotion of the scene uh, so successfully, and you're unsure where it's going until he says, "I have everything you need." Oh. But I actually had thought that it was a fish who was they were going to reveal a fish was dead, and I was going to be I was a. I was afraid yeah. of that too, actually. I was about to be I, extremely I pissed off. It. I was could not handle it. I couldn't either. Especially because oh. Fish had that great line where Claire shows up to talk to uh, Luke, and she apologizes. He's like, "Ma'am, a woman as beautiful as you never has to apologize to anyone," and just tips his hat and leaves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back to the the strangling though. Like, um, I think that says a lot about who Luke, Luke Cage is. Like he he's been going through. This has been. A monumentally shitty week for anyone. Like, he, yes, he, and he has a moment where he's like, died. he's like, he's like, I could, he's like, I could crush you. He's like, <laughs> he's, he's almost slipped. It's like, and I think that's important because, like, he he's superhuman, but he's still human. You know, like the human part is very important. Yeah. Um, I believe we we again in, in, and I really don't like the fact I said Misty and I we've been kind of glossing over her. Maria Dillard has also been very kind of looming at this point. Um. And um, this is kind of where she starts to sort of kind of is on even, not even, I guess, even playing field. She kind of is almost above Cottonmouth as a villain at this point because Cottonmouth just keeps fucking up. Yeah. Also, and she starts off the, the story, the season, if you will, uh, in trouble because she needs money. She needs the one million that from the arms sale, right? Because she took donation money and used it to refurbish Kanaus Club. Yeah, and the pressure of that is sort of in building, and she becomes more vicious as this show goes on. And you realize that I think she might be worse than Cottonmouth. She just doesn't want to admit it when she starts talking about all the different ways she's thought of to kill. Luke, you know, poison him, drown him, do whatever you need to do. There are clearly things that you haven't thought of. Uh, and she gets dark with it. Yeah, she, She's turning. She's she's, she's becoming like, Mama... What was, what was her name? Fratelli? No. no. Fratelli? <laughs> yes. yes. Black and, uh, Is that what you're trying to say? Cottonmouth is uh, sloth, and and um, shades is clearly the um, what's it? The which uh, chunk? Shades is chunk. <laughs> oh my god! No, um, Mama B- Barnes, I think. Or oh, she's becoming her uh, grandma. Yeah, Mama Maybell. Mama oh. Maybell. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this Mama was, was this the episode that had flashbacks? It doesn't no. have a back, but there's a moment where she looks at Maybell's picture. Yeah. And it really stuck out to me. And she tells the picture to shut up. And that moment, it just tells you everything you need to know about her. She can't yeah. look at the picture of her grandma because of the impact that woman had on her, making her who she is. And she's afraid of becoming her. Also, like, during the episode, she gets... This is the episode where she's having that uh, interview with Tembe. Right. And Yes, this is where they basically, she's like, oh, but Harlem's great. And they're like, yeah, you've said that a hundred times. And they mention her. You've got to change it up. So they say you're, no you're, the, you're the granddaughter of uh, Mama Mabel and her brother and something about her brother, Pistol Pete. Yeah. Yeah, this is where they basically rule over her as um as uh, cousin with Stokes and um and all that, right? Yeah, they, they basically put all the evidence to connect her to Cottonmouth just right out front. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah, this is kind of a big episode because this is uh, there's a big moral victory, I guess, throughout the show. Um. Yeah, because by the end of it, um, 
Scarf sadly dies from his wounds after kind of a lengthy chase, which climaxes with Luke Cage uh, taking a car to the chest. Yeah. Well, you, there's a funny, a little funny scene with uh, Claire's uh, mother. I don't care if you're bulletproof. If there's a scratch on my daughter, I'm going to kill you. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of great characters well, like that. I think that we're about ready to wrap up. Well, like, is there anything else yeah. you'd like to add about episode six? The episode ends with... Do we, can we say how the episode ends? It ends with... I don't know not, it's a spoiler cast. It, it ends with Strokes going away, and uh, which surprised me. But I guess it makes that, sense. Yeah, it the leaves room for Diamondback to be introduced. Yeah. The ante yeah. has to be up, and things have to happen to change the stakes of this. So, yeah, it, it, like it, we're halfway through the show, and like our primary villain actually still hasn't even showed his face yet. Um, Cottonmouth has been taken down several pegs. Uh, Dillard is stepping up, and Diamondback hasn't even really shown his face yet. Yeah. So, and yeah, like I said, we lose Scarf, um, who dies having done the right thing, more or less, by giving a bunch of evidence over, uh, which would get Cottonmouth in a whole bunch of trouble. Yeah. Um. I think we've covered all of the episodes individually. How about we all do, like, final thoughts? Like, final thoughts overall for this half. Because I feel like that's the best way to wrap. Indeed. Um, I, I, I'll just go first, I guess. Uh, I like the show a lot. I like its tone. I like, I, like the it, I like the way it looks. I like the way it sounds. Um, like I said, I did watch a few more episodes. So I'm a little farther ahead of you guys, but that's just the result of refusing to stop binging. Um... Maybe you should have used that time to sleep. Huh? Maybe you should have used that time to sleep. Oh, that had a little to do with it. I just couldn't sleep. Um, but, uh, no, I love... I, not, for me, it's just another, uh, another... So far, another home run for Netflix, uh, as far as the Marvel stuff goes. Very impressed. I love it. I can't wait to see how it all kind of ends. And I'm looking forward to the Defenders. Well, we still uh, don't even have Iron Fist yet, so... <laughs> Stop it. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. I, I know some things about a certain episode, so uh, but I won't I won't say it here. If you if Iron Fish shows up, don't even uh, oh don't even tease I, me. I'm not saying anything, I'm not saying anything. Not saying anything. But there's an episode of Collider Heroes where they talk about it and they uh, but that's another thing. So who another final thoughts? Anyone? Uh, um I really love it. It's it's easily, I think, it's right now, it's topping Daredevil as my favorite Netflix show. Wow. And that's not, really not hard for me to say. That's high praise. That's, that's high terrible. praise. Daredevil is still my favorite of the, of the three so far. This is, it's really good. I, I'm really enjoying this. I personally enjoyed the, um, the Serpent Society, basically, the Diamondbacks, the Cottonmouth, that kind of, like, bringing that in because I'm an old school, like, Captain America fanboy, like, that is, like, seminal for me to see that at all. Huh. Anybody else? Um, okay, so you guys are using the word love. And maybe it's just because the show's not over yet that I don't feel like I can say that. But yeah, I, I love what I've seen so far. The last I, half, you know, remains to be seen. Obviously, I I, I enjoy this show immensely. Um, and what I what I like most about it is um, I'm more surprised by this one than any of the previous shows. I mean, Jessica Jones surprised me at points, but every episode I'm surprised. Every episode I'm. I'm tricked into thinking I know what this show is, but it keeps on evolving, and it keeps on throwing curveballs and changing what I think the show is. Like, Daredevil, you can pretty much trace what that show is from the very first episode to the very last episode. And so, in that way, I think that this is the best show, because it continues to evolve. But... <clears throat> Admittedly, I couldn't... I if from the first episode to the last, I couldn't tell you where this is going to go. 
That's I, what I'll give it. And that's and that's very high praise. I still like a Daredevil season two the best. That yeah, being said, there's a full arc there. I know how many filler episodes there are of Daredevil season two. It's about one up, one and a half episodes, give or take. Uh, there's no filler on this though. There's no fat that okay. needs to be cut. There's no moment where I would say, no, that doesn't need to be there. And that's the an achievement. Yes. Uh, that's an achievement for Netflix shows. All of them, even the ones that I love to death, have had moments where I'm like, do we need this? Do we need to have this moment here? Could this be done better? And I haven't had that so far. It's just smooth sailing, and I couldn't, I couldn't make a moment better, in my personal, based on my personal taste. So that's credit to the screenwriters and storyboards. They planned it all out. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Alan, do you have any final thoughts? Um, I'm still sort of new to like to mar- most of the Marvel stuff. Right. Like Daredevil, Jessica Jones. Yeah. But Luke Cage probably because I've been reading Power Man and Iron Fist. I don't I feel like I don't really need anything, any backstory. Everything's just already there for you for you ready to come in. Yeah, but he hasn't said fiddle faddle yet, so. Yes. I was happy Wait. when he brought up Chester Hines. Because. Mm. That whole. Archie Goodwin thought he was. That Chester Hines was, talking, was writing real work. And when in fact he was. Actually, it was a, a fake Harlem. And I also liked it when he said Sweet Christmas. Yeah, they, that's. Sweet Christmas. I, I kind of like how okay one more point sorry Alan I didn't mean I don't mean to derail off you but I really like how they saved up the sweet Christmases like they don't just dole them out it's really nice but anyways go ahead no that was it oh that was it okay This concludes part one of our Luke Cage episode. Joining us next week for part two of episodes seven through 13 of Luke Cage should be a good one to send us off. Here's Hunter Davenport. Always forward. (laughs) 